Okay, well, uh, welcome uh, to all uh, to this latest uh, production of the American Foreign and Military Policy Cluster at the Mershon Center for International Security St Studies. On behalf of my colleagues, Chris Jelpe, Jennifer Siegel, Rick Herman, uh, and Rick Herman, we um, welcome you to the virtual Mershon Center for International S Security Studies. Our guest today is Miles Taylor. Miles is a CNN contributor and former chief of staff of the Department of Homeland Security. He served previously as the National Security Advisor on the House Homeland Security Committee, a staff member on the House Appropriations Committee, a presidential appointee in the George W. Bush administration, and in various capacities in the White House, Pentagon, and the House Speaker's Office. Miles is author of the New York Times bestseller, A Warning, a book about President Trump, and he co-founded the Republican Political Alliance for Integrity and Reform, uh, or Repair. Miles is also co-founder of the Washington Leadership Academy, a four-year high school in Washington, DC, named a top 10 super school in America. He is a currently a senior fellow at the McCreary Institute for Cybersecurity and a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Miles was a Marshall Scholar at Oxford University and a Truman Scholar at Indiana University, so a real underachiever. Miles will speak to us today about how to secure America in an age of disruption. Miles, welcome to the virtual Mershon Center and the virtual floor is yours. Pete, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. The thing that was left out on my bio is that the reason I know a lot about Homeland Security is that I grew up in a house of six children. So Homeland Security became something I had to be focused on with older brothers and sisters every single day. So I'll put that in there next time. But I also wanna say thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I know these are unique times and circumstances. And so we have to uh, do things like this remotely and virtually. There is a reason I'm really glad to be speaking uh, to folks from the Ohio State University virtually. And that's because last time I was at OSU, I left humiliated because we had the annual uh, old oak and bucket game. I'm an IU alum and we played Ohio State and we lost and we were humiliated and I left your town defeated. And I'm really glad to be remote today because I think we're gonna kick your butts this Saturday <laughs> when we play you guys. And right now no one can throw eggs or water or anything at me for saying that. And if IU loses, I'll eat crow, but this is a big year for IU football. And I know it's a big year for Ohio State football, but uh, Saturday is gonna be an interesting matchup. So I'm looking forward to it and I hope y'all will watch. So how do you like your crow? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's how it has to end up being. I'll take it broiled. Um, but uh, that should be a, an, an interesting game this year. So very glad to be joining uh, you all via Zoom. And what I wanted to do today, Pete, if this is okay with you, uh, hopefully treat this uh, a little bit informally because we're all in COVID time. So I didn't bother dressing up too much for you guys. And, and you can see my election day celebrations here still in the background of my house with balloons and flags uh, and streamers. Haven't taken those down, not taken those down for a while. So please, on your end of the internet, please uh, feel free to be casual with me. And if it's not too early where you are to have happy hour, do it or don't do it. That's entirely up to you. I want to make sure you're not bored. But today, I want to walk through uh, essentially what's the title of this conversation is how we uh, secure America in an age of disruption. And Pete, you were just going to jump in. I have your slides and I will throw them up. You want them up now? Sure. Yeah, we can start with the title slide. That would and, be, uh, for uh, those fantastic. in the audience, uh, if you have questions, go to your Q&A button down at the bottom of the screen and you can type them in there. Uh, you won't be able to go live or speak, but I will read off your questions when the time comes. So let me throw your slides up here. And everyone should be able to see those now. Fantastic. Uh, so look, uh, these slides, you'll be thrilled uh, because they are basic folks and uh, we'll go through them in just a minute. But I, I wanted to start with a brief anecdote. Uh, so not long ago, I was working at Google and I was heading up advanced technology and security strategy for the company, essentially looking at the public policy landscape, looking at national security threats and looking at technology. 
and where it was going and trying to anticipate the places where there would be increased risk and a need for increased engagement from the private sector with the government to mitigate that risk. Uh, what was great about that job is that as a company, Google and many of its peers have some of the most bleeding edge, fascinating emerging technology on the planet to solve some of the hardest problems uh, in government. And, uh, but at the same time, there are things that companies are working on in Silicon Valley that actually could potentially introduce new risks and national security challenges and threats. So that was a part of what I did at Google was engage with those parts of the national security community to help them understand where technology was going. I wanted to open today with a really brief anecdote about that time that gets to why I think in many ways the United States is behind the curve when it comes to a range of threats against this country. And that was, uh, we had someone who leads the quantum team at Google. And if you don't know anything about quantum computing, uh, essentially it's, well, it's the opposite of classical computing. If computers today are operating on ones and zeros, what quantum computing does is it takes the laws of nature and it applies them into a computing environment. So computers, in a sense, can think more organically and can solve vastly more complicated problems. So we were actually meeting with a range of folks in the national security community. You can think three letter agencies and different departments and agencies in this space in Washington, DC with some of our senior quantum scientists. And we were essentially doing the rounds in Washington to talk about the promise of quantum, where it was going, some of the pitfalls and some of the public policy challenges. In particular, I remember a meeting that we had uh, with a group of people who offered us probably fake first names and the first letters of their last names. Uh, in other words, you know, people who were in very sensitive jobs uh, who wanted to know more about where this tech was going, but of course couldn't divulge too much to us about what they worked on. Uh, and we had a long multi-hour conversation about this technology. Now I'm gonna bore you for a second because in the near term, one of the most promising things about quantum computers is that they will help solve everyday challenges. For instance, batteries. Uh, you know, right now I have sitting in front of me my AirPods case, right? My AirPods can charge for about 24 hours. There's about 24 hours worth of charge uh, in there. But trying to get this case to charge these AirPods for 48 hours, or let's say three days or four days, is actually a very, very complex mathematical challenge. Batteries chemically are one of the more complicated things to try to optimize for efficiency. What can help solve that problem? Something like a quantum computer that can do the very difficult calculations to make a battery more efficient. Um, other examples, you could think of things like uh, climate modeling. Weather modeling is very, very complex. Classical computers have a tough time modeling all of the different factors when it comes to a hurricane or a tornado or an earthquake or, or an earthquake in a way that a quantum computer could solve that problem a little bit more uh, easily. Uh, synthetic materials are also difficult uh, for classical computers to understand how to make them stronger or tougher, whatever your objective is. You're hearing these things right now and thinking, that's great. We could have a better world with more efficient batteries and uh, better climate modeling, um, but it can sound a little bit banal. So we're walking through in this room with these people from the national security community where quantum computing is headed. And one of our lead scientists at the company, uh, and Google, by the way, has I would argue the most sophisticated quantum computer in the world, probably several uh, years ahead of the competition uh, around, uh, around the globe. And uh, one of the chief scientists jumps in uh, and we're almost at the end of the presentation and someone asks, yes, yes, yes. Okay, this is what co quantum computers are going to be able to do in this decade, but what about in the 2030s? Where is this technology really headed? Uh, and this German American scientist says, well, I, I will tell you that, uh, that I believe in the next decade that our quantum computers uh, will have the analog of human feelings, uh, that our computers will quite literally be able to feel. And uh, <laughs> you could see all the faces in the room drop. Uh, and then we looked at the clock and our scientists said, but uh, I'm afraid uh, that's all the time we have today and we'll have to leave. I tell you that story because when we looked a decade out, the people in the room in the national security community felt like they had a grasp on what they needed to prepare for 
when it came to quantum computers. And that includes breaking encryption. We're gonna talk about this a little bit later on. One of the concerns about quantum computing technology is that the encryption we rely on today, the encryption that likely is protecting the Zoom call from an outside hacker or is protecting your iMessages sent to your friends or is protecting your emails, that encryption with a quantum computer can be broken. That has enormous implications. You can imagine a hypothetical scenario right now where uh, even though that encryption can't be broken, an adversary nation state could be hoovering up your encrypted communications. And then once they have a quantum computer, could go back in time and break them and see what you've been sending. That's a big concern. It's something the national security community has been thinking about. They knew that was a problem. What they didn't expect to hear that day in the room is that a decade from now, they might need to be preparing for the possibility of machines going from machine learning to authentic machine intelligence to machines that actually have feelings. And what does that mean for national security? Well, the implications are enormous. The implications are almost impossible to fathom. Uh, we, we didn't get out of the room quickly that day, even though the time was up, because we got sucked into a conversation about what that would look like and how to deal with the fallout. Preparing for the future really requires extensive forethought, and it requires the federal government to do something it's very, very bad at, and that is keeping its fingers on the pulse of emerging threats and emerging technology. We tend to be behind the curve on these things. So today, I mean, the title of this conversation was How to Secure America in an age of disruption. What I want to do is talk to you about what I would call threat vectors, threat vulnerabilities, and threat vigilance. And I'm gonna walk through a handful of these. By no means is this going to be comprehensive, but I wanna give you food for thought, and I wanna tee up a conversation for this group in the second 45 minutes of this talk today to go into some of these issues and to dive into ones that I don't mention. But I'm gonna start with some of the ones that after serving as chief of staff of the Department of Homeland Security, I was the most concerned about and where I felt like the country was most vulnerable and needed to pay attention, uh, additional attention and make uh, additional investment. So before I do, before I go into each of those threat vectors, where we're vulnerable in those vectors and how we can be more vigilant, I wanna put up one slide and this would be the next one, Pete. It's a very, very simple slide. Uh, this is something that in the security community, we constantly use as a rubric for determining whether we're doing a good job or a bad job in securing the country or solving a specific dilemma. And this is the risk matrix, all right? This is the risk calculus. How do you define risk? The common adage is it's threat times vulnerability times consequence. Okay, what does that really mean? That really means that you try to determine how severe the threat is. Let's say the threat is very severe. How vulnerable are we to it? It's possible it's a severe threat, but that we're really well protected against it, or maybe not. So let's say we're very vulnerable to that threat. What about the consequences? Are they high consequence or low consequences? You could have something that's a, a high threat. Mom's gonna come home and catch me not doing my homework. High vulnerability, uh, you, know, you don't know when she's gonna pop in the door, Consequences, it might be low. You're gonna get grounded. Your mom's probably not going to actually burn the house down, right? And that will determine your risk score at the end of the day. As we go through these different threat vectors today, I wanna to talk a little bit about the threat level of each of these dangers. I wanna talk about how vulnerable the United States is and also some of the consequences. And then at the end, hopefully give you a sense of what the risks are to the United States. Now, here's my reference point, is the post 9-11 era. So a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today is I'm gonna to try to roughly compare where the United States is at now compared to where we were around 9-11 and around the period when we created the Department of Homeland Security a few years after 9-11, right? Just as a baseline. Uh, and, and then we can talk about that, uh, what that means for the country and, and what reforms perhaps uh, the next presidential administration should consider to make the country safer. So Pete, if you wouldn't mind jumping to the next slide. We're gonna keep this sort of pithy. A lot of you that are watching today are familiar with the meme that's going around the internet. And the meme is essentially how it started, how it's going. Now, Guy Fieri put up a great post that I think is an example of 2020, right? We could say that 2020 started off just like Guy Fieri laughing right there on the side. And how is 2020 going? Picture on the right, I think would resonate with most people regardless of their political opinions. Uh, it's been a difficult year for a lot of people. These memes are very funny. I'm going to try to do a much more dumbed down version for each of these threat vectors of how it started right around that 9-11 period at the turn of the millennium 
and how it's going today to walk you through a number of these different threats. So the first one that I wanna start with, Pete, and you can jump to the next slide, uh, is terrorism and targeted violence. Terrorism and targeted violence is the reason the Department of Homeland Security was created in the first place. So on the left-hand side there, what you see is a very famous image. That's Al-Qaeda operatives in training camps in Afghanistan. So about 20 years ago, this is what we were dealing when it came to terror. We were dealing with ideologically motivated violence, largely overseas, largely fueled by Islamist militants who had perverted a peaceful religion and a peaceful uh, faith for uh, malicious and violent ends. And those individuals were targeting the United States. And I don't need to walk this crowd through that threat and the threat from Al-Qaeda and ISIS, uh, or Al-Qaeda especially, in any great detail. On the right-hand side, I have another picture. This is the how it's going, right? So it started with operatives in Afghanistan. How's it going today? These are individuals that were involved in training for a domestic terrorist attack, a plot against the, gov the, the governor of Michigan. Many of you are familiar with this news story in recent weeks. Governor Whitmer of Michigan uh, was found to be under threat from a group of individuals, a well-networked, well-trained, a uh, group of individuals in the Midwest who intended potentially to kidnap and murder the governor, as well as to target other elected officials in the United States. The takeaway that I wanna give you here from the how it started to how it's going is that since the Department of Homeland Security was created, terrorism has gone viral. What's worse is that our backyards are now the front lines in the war on terror. And this is something that I don't think we anticipated in the Bush years. This is something that we worked very hard to prevent. You remember President Bush going out there and saying, we're fighting forward and we're fighting the terrorists over there so we don't have to fight them here at home. Well, the terror threat to the United States has morphed, matured and metastasized in such a way that now domestic terrorism is a much greater concern in our country than we ever anticipated uh, that it would be. And I wanna give you a point of reference for this. When I came into the Trump administration, Early on, the biggest threat to the country when it came to terrorism was ISIS. We were very concerned about ISIS. We saw very, very violent and dangerous ISIS plots overseas, and we were not nearly as concerned about domestic terrorism. But in the early days of the administration, when John Kelly and I started to get sensitive intelligence briefings about the terrorist threat, we recognized from our analysts that domestic terrorism was a bigger concern than we thought. Than we thought. And actually, as the months went on, we were getting more and more reporting from our intelligence analysts and our law enforcement officials that they were seeing a sharp uptick in these plots. Now, primarily that plotting was driven by uh, violent, uh, racially motivated extremist organizations, specifically white supremacist groups. That's really where we were seeing the threat. And in fact, when we first came in, there's roughly, the FBI will tell you, roughly two to 3,000 terrorism uh, ongoing terrorism cases at any given point in the United States. And the vast majority of those, when we came into the Trump administration, were largely tied to overseas foreign terrorist organizations like ISIS. Today, roughly 1,000 of those cases a year are domestic terrorism cases. 1,000, one third of those cases are now here in our country, homegrown cases. In fact, so far this year in the United States, we've had almost 100 and 50 arrests uh, of individuals tied to domestic terrorism. Those cases that I mentioned earlier, those 1,000 domestic terrorism cases spread all 50 states. There is not a state in the country right now that is, that is immune from a domestic terrorism investigation. That's a big deal. That's a very big deal and a big statistic and something I would not have uh, anticipated in those early days uh, of the Trump administration. Now, that's the threat level, and it's very serious. And I wanna talk a little bit about the vulnerability. How vulnerable are we to domestic terrorism? Unfortunately, I'm gonna to say to this crowd today, we're very vulnerable to domestic terrorism in this country. And that's because we did not do the things that we should have done early enough to prevent it. That's not to say that DHS and the FBI aren't doing the hard work of going after the bad guys. They are, they are laser focused on the threat. But I wanna compare it to ISIS. So when ISIS rose in the Middle East in 2014, 2015, the Obama administration was criticized for being slow in recognizing the threat. 
the end result is that the ISIS terror threat spread like wildfire. We had people around the world who were engaging with operatives in places like Syria and places like Libya and places like Tunisia, getting instructions, getting guidance and getting the ideological motivation to go conduct attacks in their hometown. I say this because the slowness in confronting the ISIS threat resulted in a much more dangerous threat that spread very rapidly. I would compare that in a certain, to a certain extent to what we're seeing right now with the domestic terrorism threat. We knew it was real. We knew it was growing. But at certain levels in the administration, that was ignored. And as a result today, we have a much more prolific uh, and severe threat and one where individuals who are totally disconnected from each other are now starting to network and that threat's growing. In fact, there are domestic terrorists here in the United States who are engaging with like-minded individuals in places like Europe and around the world, comparing notes on tactics, techniques, procedures, trade craft, uh, and trying to get better at what they do. That's something that was potentially uh, preventable. And I want to talk a little bit about that. So that's the threat vector is terrorism. The threat vulnerability when it comes to terrorism today, I think in the United States is especially high when it comes to domestic terrorism. And in the Q&A today, I'm happy to talk about foreign terrorism. I think the United States has been not inoculated against foreign terrorist threats, but extraordinary measures have been taken to protect this country against threats from groups like ISIS and Al Qaeda. And happy to talk about that in detail. Uh, but the threat vigilance piece, what do we do to solve for this inattention on domestic terrorism. Now, unfortunately, um, like I said, there wasn't enough done early on. And I want to avoid getting too political in today's talk, but I am going to give you a few anecdotes of why we ended up in the place that we're in across a number of these threat vectors. And some of those are inherently political. In the case of domestic terrorism, unfortunately, this was something that we at DHS, the FBI, and the intelligence community regularly warned the White House about. Uh, but the threat was ignored. In fact, we insisted that the White House release a national counterterrorism strategy that prioritized domestic terrorism because we were seeing this danger growing within our own country. There were some individuals at the time, a few years ago, who felt like the threat wasn't real, that it was politicized, that uh, going after so-called right-wing extremist groups was actually just an exercise to alienate the president's supporters. And as a result, if you pull up the nation's counterterrorism strategy right now, you will see almost no reference whatsoever to domestic terrorism in that document. I believe there are two sentences that talk about it. As a consequence, this administration for the past four years hasn't undertaken the, the whole of government effort that is needed to bring additional resources, personnel, and attention to the problem to thwart it. Much in the way we did after 9-11, we had a whole of government response against foreign terrorist organizations like Al Qaeda. Today, uh, the federal government has not mounted a similar response and it's actually very critical that it does. So let me talk briefly about a few things that could be done uh, and should be done to address the domestic terrorism threat in the United States. I'm gonna talk about prevention, detection and disruption. On the prevention side, this is very simple because I'm gonna tell you right up front folks, we know how to combat terrorism. Our experience post 9-11 taught us a lot about these groups regardless of ideology. It doesn't matter, matter if it's Islamist militancy or if it's violent white supremacism. A lot of the tools are the same. And so the next administration needs to be thinking about how to put those tools in place to combat, combat the domestic threat. One of them is very simple, it's counter messaging. A lot of terrorism is ideologically motivated and spread. And that's why it spreads organically and it spreads very, very quickly is because people share it through their networks, they radicalize each other, they self-radicalize. And then before you know it, you've got either a lone wolf terrorist or in the case of the Michigan plot, a group of individuals that are uh, very close to executing a dangerous operation. So what you have to do is counter message that ideology. It requires focusing on what's animating those individuals towards violence, interrupting that radicalization cycle uh, and, and breaking it. Another piece of it is screening and vetting. There's a lot of different mechanisms that can be done to determine in a lawful way that's respectful of, uh, of civil society and civil liberties protections rather, uh, but doing the appropriate screening and vetting of individuals when they potentially apply for sensitive jobs and sensitive places, just doing the background checks that are needed to make sure that individuals who are potentially under federal investigation for ties to domestic terrorists don't end up in sensitive positions where they could cause additional harm. But most importantly here is detection and disruption. 
when it comes to this threat. This threat is spreading so quickly that the federal government is not capable of keeping up with it. When we talk about crowdsourced terrorism, uh, and we talk about crowdsourced violence, that's not something that the federal government with its lumbering big bureaucratic legs and slow mind is uh, capable of quickly detecting and disrupting. The key here is community awareness. And this is something that we found with the ISIS threat. In fact, we did a back of the envelope assessment of ISIS terror plots in the United States and why they were stopped and how they were stopped. This was several years ago. And what we found is that in more than 50% of cases, I think it was something like nearly 75% of plots that we disrupted, there was a community nexus. What do I mean by a community nexus? I mean, in those 75% of cases, the majority that we stopped, there was either a family member, a friend, a confidential source in the community, a neighbor, or another individual who essentially acted as a tripwire, someone who called authorities because they were concerned someone who engaged with law enforcement because they saw something and said something. It's one of the most boring phrases in national security, see something, say something. It also happens to be one of the single most effective tools that law enforcement has, is that community members, essentially you can think of them as sensors all around the country. We have 300 plus million sensors in this country, people who are walking around every day that see things that law enforcement can't see. We stopped a lot of those plots and we saved a lot of American lives because people were brave enough in their communities to say something. The problem with domestic terrorism is that today there isn't that same level of community awareness. You could ask almost anyone in this country about ISIS and they'd say, oh yeah, ISIS terror plot. And they'd have a rough sense of uh, you know, what that period was like. And people were, had heightened awareness, especially in big cities about suspicious activity. We don't have the same thing right now in this country when it comes to domestic terrorism. And so a future administration really needs to prioritize community awareness so that we have those trip wires and so that people can, be, uh, can notify authorities about the threat. So that's terrorism. I wanna to jump to the next slide. Uh, and I wanna talk about something that I would maybe consider a subset of terrorism and targeted violence. Uh, and, and that's explosives in general, the actual means of conducting attacks. We are seeing a lot of changes in this age of disruption that are making it hard for the government to keep up. On the left-hand side, how it started, what you see is a shoe. That shoe belonged to Richard Reed, who in the post 9-11 years was the attempted shoe bomber who tried to detonate a flight, leaving New York by packing explosives in his boot. On the right, you see a weaponized drone. And that weaponized drone, I actually don't know. Uh, I think that's a drone shooting a flamethrower. Uh, but there are real examples that we've now seen in recent years of drones carrying things like grenades, or other munitions that have become a threat. And it's something that we are potentially very vulnerable to. In fact, I wanna give you a quick anecdote and jump back. And as we're talking about the threat vulnerability, take you back a few years. Uh, several years ago when I was working on Capitol Hill for the House Homeland Security Committee, I helped the chairman at the time, Michael McCall, write a book. He wrote a book uh, about the greatest dangers to the United States and how we thwart them. And the book opened up with a chapter about a drone swarm coming towards the United States Capitol uh, and wreaking havoc and attacking members of Congress. And at that point in time, the chairman considered that to be a really far out, pretty unlikely threat to happen. Only a few years later, that's now a scenario that we're very worried about in the national security community is drone swarms, especially autonomous drone swarms that are potentially weaponized and can do real harm uh, and real destruction. This is a threat that's very bad, uh, most sensitive sites in this country, from tall buildings to sports stadiums, are inadequately protected against this type of threat. And it's also, for all intents and purposes, cheap. It's relatively cheap to do. Now, Richard Reed on the left, the shoe bomber, it was a very complex plot and one that was disrupted uh, and one that required a lot of coordination. An individual could conduct a, a drone attack very inexpensively and potentially without being noticed. And it's something that we are not nearly as prepared uh, for as a country as we need to be. Also, when I was at the Department of Homeland Security, we saw things like drugs being smuggled across the border with drones. Now, that's not a high amount of drugs and certainly not enough drugs to be profitable for someone because drones can't carry that much, but that is in and of itself a threat. You can talk about building a, a border wall from sea to shining sea. That's not gonna make a damn bit of difference if the bad guys are bringing in contraband by just flying over the wall. So things like that are a major concern. 
uh, and there's certainly vulnerability there. Um, but I'll give you a sense of the challenges. So when we talk about the threat vigilance and how we can be more aware of this threat and how we can uh, thwart it, um, there are unexpected challenges. So drones, for instance, I wanna keep using this example because when it comes to the realm of explosives, that is a big medium term concern for the security community. Um, when we went to the president of the United States to talk about the drone threat, what we found was this. Uh, we did an assessment, and I can't get into too much detail about this assessment, but let's say we'll call it a war game. We did a war game on how prepared we are against potential drone threats in a certain part of the country. The results of that war game were terrifying uh, because the bad guys in this fake scenario were successful far more often than we wanted them to be. And so we started looking at how can we implement much more robust drone defenses around the United States. DHS took a big picture look at the country and said, how do we get to a place, not two years from now, but 10 years from now, where really the country is vastly better protected against this world that we know is coming, a world of Amazon delivery drones everywhere that may be difficult to differentiate between a dangerous drone that's armed with a grenade. The conclusion that we came to was a very boring but very important conclusion. We needed to change the law because under the law, a drone, in order to stop it, actually needs to be hacked. It needs to be hacked and its electronics need to be brought down. Now, kinetically, you can try to shoot the thing down, but that's really hard, especially when there's drones that you can buy, commercial off-the-shelf drones that go 100 miles an hour. And so you had to figure out a way, uh, non-kinetically, to potentially bring down those drones. Well, what we found was to do that, you would actually break wiretapping laws because it's illegal in the United States for the federal government to simply wiretap someone's private device that's transmitting a signal, even if it's to intercept it, uh, if it's on the way to causing an attack. So what we ran into is archaic laws that said, no, even if that thing represents an imminent threat, it would be illegal to hack into it rapidly to stop that device. So we went to the president of the United States and we said, Mr. President, we need your help. We need to go to Congress and we need to have them change the law to take down these drones. But it was a complicated issue. And it was complicated to expend, uh, explain to the president the you know, pen register and wiretap laws. And the president said, no, 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 I don't care. Just shoot him down. He said, no, no, Mr. President, you don't understand. We get it. If there's an armed drone coming in, yes, we should shoot it down. But the problem is, if this happens around the country, law enforcement officers on the front lines will have personal liability if they're shooting down these devices. We've got to get the law changed so there's uh, an exception. Fortunately, that's something that we focused a good deal on. We actually got that law passed. And there are now laws on the books that give the government in certain circumstances the authorities to develop this counter drone technology. But the threat is still uh, very large and it's a very serious one. And when it comes to th things like drones, there's still laws that need to be passed. There's acquisition authorities that need to be changed. There's a lot more the government needs to do to adapt to these changes to better protect the country. Yet another example of how quickly the information age is moving and how hard it is to keep up. And, and while we're talking about the information age, I wanna make a point. 90% of the data that's been produced in human history, 90% of the data has been produced in the past two years. And that's because we are so quickly moving into the information age that both the data we produce and the threats that we face are rapidly, rapidly changing. And that number, that 90% in two years is gonna shrink to 95% in one year and tighter and tighter and tighter uh, as we produce uh, more data. So that gives you a sense of how quickly uh, these threat streams go and, and, and how challenging it is for a government to deal with them. Uh, Pete, if you wanna to jump to the next slide, I wanna talk very briefly uh, about cyber because I think we'll talk a good bit about this in the Q&A. Okay, how it started on the left-hand side, you've got a, a desktop computer that you would have expected around the post 9-11 time period Look, in that time period, we were really concerned about folks hacking into government systems, folks stealing government secrets, uh, maybe threats against banks and the financial system. Since then, the cyber threats to this country have grown exponentially. We could do a whole talk of three hours and only scratch the surface. How's it going? On the right-hand side, there's a reason why I wanted to put a picture of an iPhone. Uh, I believe that's the iPhone 12, the new one. I wanted to put a picture of someone turning it off because there are threats out there in the cyber domain that are so sophisticated that you could have the cell phone that's in your pocket or sitting in front of you while, while you're watching this, you could have that device turned off or what you think is turned off. And an adversary could still be recording audio, could still be recording video, 
and could still be taking sensitive information from your phone about your personal financial history, your health history, or if you're in a sensitive, a sensitive national security job, what your movements are. Uh, that can be done. Our adversaries today, whether they are nation states or transnational criminal organizations, have become so sophisticated in the cyber realm that we are struggling to keep up. In fact, one of the former heads of the National Security Agency a few years ago called the cyber threats to this country the greatest transfer of wealth in human history. But just judging uh, on the amount of uh, information that's been stolen about, about Americans and used for nefarious financial purposes, the greatest transfer of wealth in human history because of the cyber threats that we face in this country. Um, I could go on for a long time and give you a lot of anecdotes about the vulnerabilities in cyberspace, but I won't do that because you all have heard cyber lectures uh, from here until Sunday. What I do want to talk about very briefly are some of the solutions, the threat vigilance. How do we get ahead of the curve when it comes to, ahead of the curve rather, when it comes to cyber threats here in the United States? The first thing we have to do is reorganize ourselves. And I'm going to give you a piece of good news. Two years ago, almost to the day, the president signed into law something called the Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA. This is now the nation's premier domestic cybersecurity agency. It's something that I'd spent 10 years of my career working on on Capitol Hill and then in the administration, along with a whole host of other people who really deserve the credit. But this is now going to be the tip of the spear in the federal government when it comes to defending Americans U.S. networks and working with the private sector to protect against the emerging threats that we are seeing in cyberspace. So the good news here is the government is reorganizing in the ways that need to be done. The bad news is that we probably lost a decade when compared to our adversaries on things like offensive cyber operations, right? Nation states like Russia, China, North Korea launch very sophisticated attacks every single day against this country, our networks, and the American people, right? From corporate boardrooms to kitchen tables, we face these threats. Um, but it's taken a long time for the US government to get into a place where it has the tools to punch back. Now, some of that I can't get into. Some of that are things that uh, have happened in the US government to take the gloves off, if you will, to be able to go after those nefarious operators in cyberspace and to stop them. But there's a lot more that needs to be done there. And it's something that an incoming Biden administration should really focus on, should seriously consider what the Trump administration has done, but double down on some of the more aggressive authorities that have been put in place because the bad guys aren't letting up and we've really got to increase our attention here. But again, I want to save some of that for the Q, for Q&A because we could go so many different directions with cyber uh, that I want to hear what questions you all have. Uh, Pete, if I could jump to the next slide, I'm going to talk briefly about natural disasters. Um, look how it started. On the left-hand side, the hurricane that you see there is Hurricane Katrina. We know the damage that that wreaked in 2004. On the right-hand side, you see a storm system of three different hurricanes that were coming towards the United States. I'm not going to make the claim today that in that 10 or 15 years, we've seen an exponential increase in natural disasters. That's not necessarily the case. But if you look at data from the Insurance Information Institute, and you look at, in particular, the past, um, you know, the past year. In 2019, I think they indicate that there were 120 natural disasters worldwide, 120 major natural disasters worldwide that resulted in $150 billion in losses. If you go back to 1980, 40 years ago, that number was only around 200, 200 major natural disasters and a lower level of uh, losses. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that, and we're not going to make it political today. Some of it is climate change. Some of it is increased population density in places where disasters hit. But the fact of the matter is, we are facing a vastly costlier and more lethal natural disaster environment than we did when the Department of Homeland Security started. There's a lot that needs to be done for this country to prepare for a future where we are going to have increased damage from these types of events. What can we do about it? So are we vulnerable to it? Yes. As man-made climate change gets worse, we have to be aware of the climate changing. We have to anticipate how it's changing. That doesn't necessarily mean prescribing policy solutions uh, in the political space on climate change that we don't want to get into today and discuss. But in the national security space, there's a lot that needs to be done to prepare for those eventualities. Namely, a very boring but very important word, pre-disaster mitigation. 
So a lot of attention has been put on and needs to be put on preparing these coastal communities and other places in the United States that face natural disasters for that future, for a future that's more volatile, so future that's more volatile when it comes to the weather. Uh, and that's something that we put a lot of time and attention into. But again, it's not a sexy thing to talk about. Pre-disaster mitigation isn't something people want to think about. They don't want to spend billions of dollars preparing their communities for something that may not ever happen. But when there is that lack of preparation, it results in severe economic and loss of life to this country. So something that's very important for us to think about when we think about national security, we often forget about natural disasters and the impact they can have. So that's another threat vector where I think that the situation is overtaking the US government's level of preparedness. I wanna to jump to the next slide. And I wanna talk about weapons of mass destruction. On the left, how it started, that's a letter from the anthrax plot against the United States in the immediate period post 9-11. A handful of people tragically died, a number of people were sickened, and the nation was in fear. On the right-hand side, most of you are familiar with the pathogen on that screen, that's COVID-19. Uh, just a number of years, after we created the Department of Homeland Security, uh, about a decade and a half after, we are now facing a once in a century global pandemic. And I think if this pandemic demonstrated anything when it comes to the US government, it was the extraordinary lack of preparedness. We have to be ready for another biological event of this magnitude. And the only way to be ready is to make sure the structures are in place. And I know I'm getting close to time here, so I'm gonna skip through these pretty quickly. And I'm. I'm welcoming questions in this space. But the biggest problem I would say with COVID is that the tools that were on the shelf to respond to a pandemic like this were not used. So after 9-11 in the Bush administration and the Obama administration, a lot of time was spent on pandemic preparation. People were concerned in the federal government that this type of event, almost exactly this type of event could happen. And we designed an entire system to deal with it. Again, at the risk of being political, unfortunately, under this administration, those blueprints weren't followed. Those blueprints weren't used. And as a result, I do believe we had much greater loss of life than we otherwise would have if those plans were followed. What's my one recommendation when it comes to weapons of mass destruction right now? It's that we have a 9-11 style commission to focus on COVID-19, not the partisan political aspects, but to focus on what the government should have been doing, what recommendations we can put in place to make sure that those structures are used into the future so that we don't have this type of loss of life that we've experienced with nearly a quarter of a million Americans having died from this threat. There are other dangers, severe dangers in the biological realm, the chemical realm, and the radiological and nuclear realm that we can talk about in a little bit that during my time at the Department of Homeland Security, we tried to do a lot to thwart. And I'm happy to say, that there is now inside the federal government a belly button, a central coordinating point to go after these threats. And it's called the Office of Countering we Weapons of Mass Destruction, CWMD, at the Department of Homeland Security. It's something very on we realized did not exist, that there was an array of disparate agencies dealing with weapons of mass destruction throughout the Homeland Security enterprise. The good news is in the past couple of years, we pulled them all together into one unit to look at these threats more holistically. In a Biden administration, they're gonna to have to double down on that increase investment and make sure we're ready for the next pandemic or the next threat that's around the corner. Uh, I wanna end with uh, two more. So if we could jump to the next slide, I wanna talk about nation state threats. Post 9-11, um, this is not quite a nation state threat, but on the left-hand side, how it started, what you're seeing is El Chapo, a big drug cartel leader arrested. He was arrested after the Bush administration. But I want to use that as an example, because during the Bush years, when it came to homeland security, the biggest nation state threats we were worried about were really drug cartels coming in from Mexico. Now, that's not to say they were supported by the Mexican government. That's, that's why this is a borderline example. Um, but that's really the, the biggest concern that we had coming out of nearby nation states was, uh, was the drug cartel threat. On the right-hand side, what you see are intercontinental ballistic missiles from North Korea. And I want to give you another quick anecdote. When I came into DHS with John Kelly, around that time period, as many people recall, there was a lot of tension on the Korean Peninsula. Kim Jong-un was firing off missiles. Kim Jong-un was making very vocal and bellicose threats against the United States. And we did get to a point where many of us were very worried behind the scenes that we were eerie, uh, we were veering quite close to potential low-level or open warfare 
in some way, shape or form. And you have to prepare for that, no matter how unlikely the scenario. And one day I called together our senior leadership team at the Department of Homeland Security and said, we need to brief the secretary. If we have an event with North Korea, we are gonna be responsible here on the home front for undertaking a range of protective actions. I can't get into the details of that meeting. It was a pretty sensitive one. But what I can tell you is when I looked across the table and I said, what do we do? Let's say Kim Jong-un, arms and missiles coming towards the United States. What are the immediate next steps in this department? The response that I got back was blank faces. People had not contemplated in a very long time the threat from a nation state to our homeland security because so much of homeland security was focused on counterterrorism in the post 9-11 era. Since that time, we have undertaken a wholesale reinvention of the homeland security enterprise to think more holistically about these threats from nation states. Yes, the Defense Department uh, protects us against those dangers overseas, but when it reaches the homeland, it's up to DHS and other authorities. So there's a lot of thinking that's been done in this space. But in addition to the kinetic threats we face from countries like North Korea, we are also very vulnerable to non-kinetic threats from countries like China. And I wanna give you a data point to hold on to. Last year in the United States, there were 5,000 open counterintelligence investigations, investigations into countries that were spying on the United States, trying to steal our secrets and trying to undermine our country and make it more vulnerable. Fully one half of those 5,000 counterintelligence investigations were of Chinese individuals or individuals connected to the Chinese Communist Party. One half. That is extraordinary. There is a prolific counterintelligence threat to the United States. And it's something that, again, in this age of disruption, we have fallen far behind the curve. There's a lot the United States needs to do to keep up. There's a lot that great civil servants have done. That's the vulnerability when it comes to the threat vigilance and what we need to do. The answer, quite frankly, is we need a vastly clearer system in the federal government for tracking and holding these nation states that are trying to interfere in our country accountable. And as a subset of that, I'll use as an example, uh, foreign interference in our democracy. Uh, and, and I wanna show you the, the consequences of not having gone after this problem soon enough. When we came into office in 2016 or in early 2017 rather, we of course had just experienced, in my opinion, an almost 9-11 scale event. And that was Russian interference in the 2016 election. It was extraordinary and it was brazen. But the failure to decisively pr punish the Russian government after that interference has resulted in a situation where now today we have multiple countries in the game. The Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians, and other nation states have said, well, look, this works. It's effective to meddle in America's democracy. We're not getting punished for it. So we should continue to do it. That's a big problem. And the next administration absolutely must prioritize doing what this administration did not do enough of, which is focusing on attribution and consequences in that space. Finding out what the bad guys are doing to interfere in our democracy and punishing them decisively, decisively to deter future activity. There is good news that we can talk about in the Q&A on election integrity. A great deal was done under this administration to protect our actual physical voting systems to the point that DHS was able to confidently say the other day that this was the most secure election in modern American history. I firmly believe that to be the case. And that's because the great work that was done on the cybersecurity side to protect our voting systems. Uh, if we could jump uh, to the next one, actually, we can jump past that one to the very last slide on there. Machines, that's the last thing I wanna talk about. And I wanna end with something that I hinted at here uh, at the beginning in the conversation about where quantum computing is going. How did it start? On the left-hand side, you see a uh, famous toy. That's the Furby. On the right-hand side, you see the T-1000 Terminator from the film Terminator. Uh, how did this start? Well, look, around the time period that DHS was created, many people remember the Furby toy. Well, Furby was actually a national security threat. And I'll tell you why, because at the time, this very little toy was created that had extremely, extremely low level I don't even, if, even know if you could call it artificial intelligence capabilities, but the Furby could respond to human interaction. The Furby, it also turns out, was recording conversations that people had in its presence. So Furbies were banned at that time period as a potential security threat from sensitive government buildings because they might record and repeat back uh, things that they had learned. That's how it started. Uh, how is it going right now? I put the T-1000 up there, not to scare people, but to go back to that conversation that we had on the Google side, when we were talking to the federal government 
That is machine learning is going to take off exponentially in the next decade. I do not believe that your government is prepared for that. Now, people are aware, but that doesn't mean that they are prepared. Now, machine learning, artificial intelligence, quantum computing are going to completely change the face of the economy and society as we know it. But that will also create new dangers. Those new dangers include um, autonomous uh, you know, weaponry and kill systems that could put American lives in danger at home and abroad uh, and other nefarious cyber activity that happens autonomously. It's something that more attention is needed and there's more investment needed in this space. And since we're low on time, my one recommendation would be we need to treat this like the space race. We need a space act for quantum computing so that there's intense federal investment in this area so that the United States stays in the lead when it comes to these technologies so we can also anticipate the dangers that are coming in front of us. So those are the threat vectors that I wanna walk through. If we wanna to jump to the last slide, I wanna bring the risk matrix back up. So given everything that we just talked about, threat, the threats against this country are proliferating rapidly and as rapidly as information is compounding in our global eco ecosystem. Vulnerability, because the threats are expanding so rapidly, we remain vulnerable to them longer than we normally would because it's taking longer for the federal government to catch up. Consequences, this is a big concern because the consequences of some of these threats that we've talk about, talked about are not immediately clear. Oftentimes the primary consequences uh, are clear. If there's a cyber attack that locks you out of your bank account, uh, that's gonna keep you from withdrawing money. But what are the secondary, tertiary, and other effects of you being locked out of your bank account, multiple be people being locked out of their bank accounts? Well, it might be that you can't spend money. If you can't spend money, you can't feed your family. You know, If you can't feed your family, you're not supporting the local economy, and on and on and on. There's cascade effects that are difficult to predict. So in this age of disruption, I would say that equation lines up to much greater risk to the homeland than we saw in the immediate post 9-11 period than we saw when the Department of Homeland Security was created. A lot needs to be done in this space. Because I've gone well into overtime on my speaking, I won't get into the executive, legislative, uh, public and other solutions, big picture to go after this, but hopefully in talking about some of those threat vectors, you get a sense of where we stand as a country. I'm also happy to talk about foreign and defense policy what our current posture is, and what we need to do as a country to guard against some of these threats overseas so we don't have to confront them here at home. So Pete, maybe I will throw it back to you to moderate uh, some questions since I did a massive word dump there, but I would love to hear what you all are thinking out there in the audience. And no question is off limits, but I'm sure Pete will screen them, but Pete, feel free to bring the crazy ones in too. Okay, well, thanks for that, Miles. Very uh, informative. And uh, you do have about seven questions. so. Um, the first one uh, from Peter Shane, have there been legislative restrictions imposed, uh, e.g. appropriations riders, that have limited DHS's discretion to investigate domestic terrorism from white supremacist groups? That's a really, gra uh, really great question. I, I don't think the answer is yes. Um, you know, and I've, I left the administration a year ago, and so that could have changed since I left the administration. I will say the biggest hindrance right now in terms of this nation's response to domestic terrorism is the fact that it's been very difficult to get the White House and the president uh, to, to focus on the threat. Uh, th there's, there's, there's no avoiding you know, some of the political overtones of making that statement. And I don't say that in a partisan way. I'm a lifelong Republican. I did go serve in this administration. Many of you know I did oppose the president's reelection for a lot of these reasons we've talked about today because I'm concerned about where uh, our nation's security is after four years. But on that specific issue, there just wasn't a lot of top level White House attention on the threat. And I actually think that's what's held us back the most is there needs to be that effort to bring all departments and agencies and resources together to go after it, much like we did Al Qaeda uh, and against ISIS. So I don't think the burdens are legislative, except one caveat, and that is you mentioned appropriations riders. There is a desperate need for increased funding in this space. We've spent so much money, ungodly amounts of money fighting wars overseas against foreign terrorist organizations. Some people may agree with uh, the federal government having done that. Some people listening today may disagree. Uh, but what I think we can all agree on 
is that if, if we're talking about a thousand domestic terrorism investigations here in our country, it really is imperative to spend the money uh, to go after those individuals, to map out those networks uh, and to break them down. So that's something that certainly needs to be done. Well, on that same vein, uh, Saber Weber wonders how you define homegrown. And uh, she brings up the example of the Las Vegas shooting uh, from the hotel. Is uh, it, Does that kind of homegrown terrorism fit into your scenario? That's, that's, that's a great question. I didn't have too much time to get into it, but I called it terrorism and targeted violence for a reason, because we've seen a phenomenon in recent years that we weren't seeing nearly as much after 9-11, and that is individuals who aren't necessarily politically or ideologically motivated still conducting mass attacks. It, it's not that you only want to stop the terrorist who's motivated by an ideology. You also want to stop the lunatic who maybe has no ideology and is going to potentially commit an attack in our country. So uh, we call that targeted violence. It's very important to focus on. When I was at the department, we developed a strategy for protecting soft targets in crowded places and had a big nationwide deployment of that strategy focused on exactly that question. And the Las Vegas shooter is a great example. That's the type of plot where law enforcement studied it for years. They tried to determine whether the individual had an ideological motivation. And my recollection was the ultimate, excuse me, the ultimate conclusion of that case was that the individual wasn't motivated by a specific ideology and therefore it couldn't be, caused, uh, it couldn't be called terrorism because by definition, terrorism is violence meant to intimidate or coerce a civilian population, usually to an ideological end. That's terrorism by definition. So when we talk about a white supremacist, their goal for conducting a terrorist attack isn't just to kill someone from another race that they hate, it's to intimidate that wider race in the country in order to change their behaviors and actions. Uh, same thing with terrorist groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Their avowed goal was to conduct political violence to intimidate or coerce the American people to change their political decisions. That's terrorism by definition. When you have someone like a shooter in Las Vegas, it's tough to put them in that bucket if that's not their motivation. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be investing the same level of resources and attention to stop those types uh, of attacks. That needs to be done. It needs to be focused on. And there's a good deal more work uh, to happen in that space. So that would fall under crime then rather than terrorism? Correct, but, but there's a reason why in the government we started to bucket those two together because what you see in those attacks, uh, those attacks is a lot of the same uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures that you see in the terrorism domain. So it's really helpful to have those professionals working together because they know how to do the prevention side really, really well when it comes to counterterrorism. And that certainly applies to a lot of those cases we've seen uh, with those mass shootings. Yeah, it would seem that they both fall under the purview of the FBI. Then? Uh, yeah, the FBI and DHS really are, are the two key players in that space at the federal level. Uh, and then really, it's a lot of, you know, state and local law enforcement cooperation. I mean, the, the, the soft targets and crowded places security plan that we released when I was at DHS was really focused on protecting some of those vulnerable places around the country, regardless of who the attacker was, right? I mean, if you're an innocent American that's under threat, it doesn't matter to you if the bullet's coming at you from someone who's an Islamist militant or the bullet's coming at you from a white supremacist or someone without an ideology, there's a bullet coming at you. So how do we better protect those mass gatherings and those soft targets around the country against potential violence? A lot of work's been done in that space, but it's a difficult thing to do. We're a big country, we're an open society. And, uh, and how do we balance that openness with the need for security? It will be an ongoing debate, but I'm really proud of the work that civil servants in our government did uh, to advance those goals. Now, you said something that actually um, kind of gets into this next question. You said it falls under the purview of the FBI and DHS, but explain to us all what DHS is. It's a conglomeration of a bunch of different agencies and actually DHS itself is what, a small headquarters and an an analysis shop? Or what, what is actually up at yeah. DHS uh, besides all the various agencies underneath it? Yeah, Pete, that's a great question. I mean, for those who don't know, the Department of Homeland Security, which was created in the immediate years after 9-11, was cobbled together from roughly two dozen agencies around the federal government. Its responsibilities include everything from domestic cybersecurity, aviation security, border security, counterterrorism, FEMA, responding to man-made uh, and natural disasters. As I mentioned earlier, countering weapons of mass destruction, um, you know, a, a, an array of immigration vetting 
uh, departments and agencies and a whole host of other security apparatuses, such as the United States Secret Service, such as the Federal Protective Service that protects federal courthouses and federal buildings around the country. It is really a hodgepodge. So one of the things that we grappled with the past few years was, who are we? as a department, because the threat has changed so much that in the immediate years after the September 11th attacks, people largely viewed DHS as existing to thwart terrorism in the United States. That really was the cause for its creation. And that's what a lot of its agencies started focusing on. But the threats to the country and to the homeland have changed. And DHS has such a wide array of authorities that we started to ask, well, what is the department now? What has it become? And I think the best way to put it the best way to characterize it at the risk of sounding too academic is that the Department of Homeland Security really exists to protect the country against non-military threats to the domestic uh, population. And that includes a whole, like I said, cybersecurity and other dangers, but the non-military threats. And so that's what DHS is focused on doing. And that includes other things too, like economic security. Is right now, one of the things the Chinese government is doing is heavily trying to infiltrate the U.S. economy and steal U.S. intellectual property. Well, that's not something you put the Defense Department in charge of. You can't take an F-16 or a tank and fly into the financial system and stop the Chinese from stealing U.S. IP. Um, but the Department of Homeland Security does have resources and authorities under the law and tools to do that. So there's been a big overhaul underway of that department to get it to focus on that broader array of emerging threats. And that was our top objective when I was there from a national security standpoint is continue to focus on counterterrorism, but make DHS an all threats, all hazards department that it should be. Well, what, what actually falls right under the director's purview? Does he have an analysis shop? Well, so the secretary has, the, the secretary of Homeland Security has an office of intelligence and analysis and management and um, you know, civil rights and civil liberties and a policy shop and the whole array of things that you would expect to be surrounding any cabinet secretary. But then those key functions of the department that I mentioned are all different agencies right. that report direct up to the secretary. So the head of the Secret Service, for instance, or the head of CISA, the domestic cyber agency. Right. OK. Um, so the next question, which I'll read, is from Melissa Fisher. From an outsider's point of view, there seem to be a huge number of government agencies focused on national security, and in this case, homeland security. Is this effective? Is it truly necessary, given that we're $20 trillion plus in debt? And isn't the debt a national security threat? So you don't have to answer the last question because it's really political, but um, is the homeland security a, uh, agency or homeland security uh, department properly configured? Is it too big? Uh, I know there's been calls to disband it again. Um, and, and I would actually take a little bit of exception as to why it was created. It was created to bridge the gap between analysis and, and action and operations, mm -hmm. which, uh, and, and to bridge the problem with silos in different analysis from say the CIA and the FBI. And has it really been effective in doing that? Yeah. Great questions. I'll even take the controversial or the, the more political one first very quickly. Look, you're preaching to the choir. I'm a fiscal conservative. Yeah, I think we're spending way too much money on too many things in the federal government in general. But, um, but the exception I'm going to take to that uh, is on national security. I mean, look, from my perspective, it's really one of the fundamental reasons that we have government in the first place is a security mission. I mean, if you really go back deep into political philosophy and you talk about why we have government uh, at its core, uh, it's to protect people from each other and to enforce contracts, and then a whole host of other things. But I do think security is a critical mission for our government. Is a lot of, is there wasteful spending? You bet there's wasteful spending. And I'm actually a recovering congressional appropriator. So that meant I worked on the committee on Capitol Hill that was focused, uh, we were the evil budget cutters that, that trawled through the federal budget and tried to find places to cut. But I worked on national security accounts. And it was very tough when you worked on, wh whether it was the CIA or NSA or Department of Homeland Security, to find programs that you really felt like, well, we can just cut this and we'll be fine. Because a lot of those programs are focused on real things, protecting real lives, protecting real livelihoods and protecting our way of life here in the United States. So uh, do we need to do belt tightening? I think we always do as a federal government. And I do think the debt is a national security concern because it affects our overall prosperity. It affects our image in the world. It affects America's flexibility going into the 21st century and, uh, and the ability of 
future generations to protect our country and to keep it prosperous. Um, but, you know, Pete, you mentioned a good thing, and that is DHS has become a big bureaucratic morass. There have been calls to dismantle the department, uh, dismantle the department. I would push back against those calls very seriously because while this administration, uh, some people may believe that the Trump administration has heavily politicized DHS, especially when it comes to immigration issues. We can put that to the side for now. Whether or not you agree with that, uh, the department performs so many other vital functions to protect Americans every day that it's really important that it stay together. Those various agencies within DHS actually have broken down the walls that existed pre-9-11. They are working more closely together. They are identifying and disrupting, whether it's criminal plots to Americans, terrorist plots, or nation state plots from countries like Russia that we otherwise would never have detected in the first place and would never have been quick enough and responding to were it not for a department that works together. That said, DHS is 250,000 people and a $60 billion a year organization. That is big. Uh, and as a fiscal conservative, I always welcome us taking another look and finding places where we can take out the scalpel and save taxpayers money. Okay, the next question from David Cook. Uh, does the US possess effective countermeasures in the cyber field to effectively disrupt any potential attack? I would just begin by saying, we're being attacked on a daily basis. Um, Huawei became Huawei because it stole Cisco's source code for its servers. Otherwise, Cisco would be bigger than Huawei today. So um, how are we doing? How's the NSA doing? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and th that question was from David, is that correct? Uh, uh, David Cook, yeah. Yeah, David, uh, I love the question. I really wish we could sit down and have an honest deep dive into it. It involves a lot of things that are sensitive and classified that I couldn't get into, but I'm gonna point you back to some public remarks that I want you to look up on the internet, David, that John Bolton made uh, while he was still national security advisor. Bolton talked a little bit about uh, some alleged authorities that had been put in place to go after these bad guys in cyberspace more aggressively. Now, I'm not gonna get into any more details from what Bolton said, but there's some really good news articles out there that will give you a sense of uh, what the federal government might have been trying to do in this space. Um, as I noted earlier, in some ways, the gloves have come off. Uh, that's a really good thing, is we are giving our frontline operators the ability to do more in cyberspace um, that we weren't able to do before. I mean, look, when you're talking about a country like Russia or China, there really are no rules, right? Their leaders are saying, their leaders aren't saying, no, 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 you know, you can't go after an American network or you know, an American uh, cyber system and, and hack it, that's, that's too dangerous. We had intensive restrictions inside the national security community about what we could do in cyberspace. Some of those have been loosened so that those agencies can do a better job proactively protecting Americans against the attacks that have, again, in some cases, locked down financial systems, attacks that have caused entire cities and municipalities to be, uh, you know, blocked out of their uh, accounts. So that's a, that's a good thing. There's a lot happening there. And honestly, um, there are a few agencies I was prouder to work alongside of uh, than the folks at the, uh, the NSA that were working on some of these cyber challenges. There are true patriots over there and some absolute geniuses who've done brilliant things to safeguard our digital networks. But look, the threat is huge. It's prolific. It's every single day. Like I said, it's the cell phones in your pockets right now that are really on the digital front lines. Uh, and it's going to be tough to win that battle. Well, he has a follow on. And that is- Yeah, please. What, what can we do, uh, what sorts of actions can we do to China or Russia to uh, reduce their cyber attacks is, you know, best defense is a good offense, I guess. The best defense is absolutely a good offense. I want to go back to a term I used earlier, attribution and consequences. There is nothing more important when it comes to that type of bad behavior by foreign nation states than determining that it's actually happened, calling out the perpetrator, and punishing the perpetrator. And this is something we spent a lot of time debating in the administration, probably too much time debating before we ended up taking action. And that was, what are the array of, uh, the array of tools that we have available to us to hold those countries accountable? And it's not just in cyber. It doesn't have to be tit for tat. So if we're attacked by, I'm making this up, let's say the Russians attack the US energy grid and bring it down in somewhere like Los Angeles. Well, our response doesn't have to be to go take down the energy grid in Moscow. So it's important to map out all of those different escalation tools we have as a government. We can hold countries accountable with things like aid, trade, diplomacy, and yes, potentially digital or physical force. 
We can do sanctions. There's a lot of things that we can do to hold those countries accountable. What's important is that the federal government understands what that playbook is and actually uses that playbook when we are attacked. My concern, my frustration in the past few years has been that there have been circumstances. Let's talk about uh, you know, the 2016 election again, where we had brazen cyber interference from a nation state adversary, and we didn't, dis we didn't respond decisively enough to convince them hey, if you do this again, the cost will be so high, it won't be worth it. That's the simple calculus you have to impose on these nations is showing them that it's so, so costly for them to engage in that behavior that they don't do it again. Well, John Mueller actually wants to know what exactly should we have done to punish Russia for interfering in the 2016 elections? And isn't that a double standard? Shouldn't we punish ourselves since we interfere in other people's elections? Well, it's a, that's, a, that's a great question. So I, I, you know, I wouldn't be able to get into whether we do or don't interfere in other people's elections. We certainly, on the, uh, on the unclassified side, you know, we support groups like uh, pro-democracy groups in other countries. Uh, but I would say that it's different because in the case of the United States, what we agitate for overseas is people to live in countries that value free minds, free markets, and personal freedom, right? That's what the United States wants to see around the world. We want to see a freer world. So we should take no shame. No American should take any shame in the fact that the US government might in certain countries around the world support dissidents, support people who want human rights and support people who wanna get rid of autocratic, despotic, oppressive rulers and simply free their countries. You know, we don't get involved in Great Britain's elections. We don't get involved in France's elections. We don't get involved in the elections in the Netherlands. And there's a reason, because these are free countries where people have a right to determine their own destiny. Has the United States in the past gotten involved in elections in not free countries? You bet we have, but that's because as Americans, we value that everyone has human dignity and everyone around the world eventually should have uh, the right to, uh, to choose their own destiny. The difference here, of course, is you have dangerous regimes, autocratic regimes like Russia and China that want to interfere in our democracy to fundamentally destroy the democratic process, to deny Americans the ability to determine their destiny and to reduce their level of confidence in the democratic system and to sow discord. So there's not a moral equivalence there. I think we should view those other countries, those adversaries as advocating for a very, very different type of thing when they interfere uh, in elections. So. Uh, what more should we have done to the first part of your question? Um, I won't get into specific details. There were some really, really aggressive options on the table, uh, but I think there should have been extraordinary financial, extraordinary diplomatic consequences for those activities. And I think there should have potentially been extraordinary uh, cyber responses uh, to show the Russians that we wouldn't put up with it. Uh, the president was very disinterested in uh, punishing Russia after the interference in 2016. I'll just tell you firsthand because he told us, uh, you know, to my face, he, he really didn't want to do it. He wanted a good relationship with Putin. And so he essentially wanted to uh, look the other direction. We can debate about whether that was the right thing or not to do. Uh, but that's what I probably would have done as a much more robust uh, response. Okay, uh, we're going to take a couple of questions in tandem here because they deal with the same thing from Alexander sure. Wad and Andrew Zutler. Um, they want to know about the thin line between infringing on rights and preventing domestic terror plots. Uh, how and what does prevention look like without infringing on rights? Uh, how much does that matter when preventing loss of life? So I guess the ticking time bomb scenario. And um, let me see, how do you balance protecting civil liberties with thoroughly investigating threats, especially in an age where many domestic terror threats develop in online chat groups and other virtual domains? Yeah. This is a really a, a very good question. It's a tricky one. But the good news here is a lot of those tough questions have been ironed out in previous years as we do, as we investigated ISIS terror plots, Al Qaeda terror plots here in the United States, because even though the ideology is different, the same investigative rules had to apply because it's my First Amendment right. If I want to say I love Osama bin Laden, let me be clear. I don't love Osama bin Laden, but it would be my First Amendment right to say that. It's not my First Amendment right to say, I love Osama bin Laden, and I urge all of my friends to go kill uh, people at the synagogue down the street, and I'm going to go join them in shooting up the synagogue, right? That's not my right to do that. So the moment at which my speech jumps the tracks from speech to instigating or furthering a violent end 
is where you start to see those rules change. But to get to your question, yes, it's very hard to prevent because what you can't do is simply monitor everyone's free speech in this space. So there has to be a predicate is what they call it in law enforcement. There's gotta be a predicate to open an investigation. In other words, an activity needs to be uh, undertaken that crosses the lines into something that's potentially criminal. But that's really difficult when it comes to terrorism because the time between flash and bang, as we say, is really, really shortened as terrorism has gone viral. It used to be when we were tracking Al Qaeda terrorist plots in the United States, we would have a multi-month lead time. These were sophisticated long-term operations and Al Qaeda was patient. As ISIS came to the fore, what we were seeing was inspired attacks motivated online on encrypted chat rooms where we couldn't see who the terrorists were talking to. And then the next day, this might be someone going out to buy a gun to perpetuate an attack. So the time, the flash bang time was so reduced that it made it much harder for law enforcement. But the answer is still in this country and other countries, some of our allies view free speech very differently. We still view free speech so openly in this country that we do tie one hand behind our backs when it comes to investigating these plots. But that's an important trade-off that we as a society have decided to make. Uh, when I was at DHS and worked closely with the FBI director and the director of national intelligence, we would talk about this all the time, but in a way that was reverent about our democratic system, because you would go meet with, you know, uh, I'm just going to make up a country, but you might go meet with the Brits and the Brits would say, well, what are you guys doing? Normally in this circumstance, we would do X, Y, Z, and we'd be able to find the bad guys earlier. And we would say with that hand tied behind our back, we don't do that in the United States because we protect civil liberties to a much further degree because of the first amendment and other protections and the law. And that's the trade-off that we have to uh, accept in an open society. But I still think our people do a really good damn, a damn good job despite some of those inherent restrictions, making sure that we get the bad guys before bad things happen. Okay, we're gonna take two more questions because I think they're gonna take some time to answer. Um, and the first one is actually two questions from Benjamin McKean. And um, he wants to know about refu refugees and immigration. Yeah. Um, they're, they're kind of long questions, but he said that, that you defended the Trump's administration's family separation Muslim ban policies. I don't know if you did or not. This is what he's saying. Um, and that these policies did a lot to exacerbate white supremacist terrorism that is now a major threat. Um, and he wants to know, um, what are you doing to repair the harms you defended as a member of the Trump administration? So I guess let's go back and say and ask, did you support those policies at Homeland Security? If so, why? And could you just talk a little bit more generally about the danger of refugees and immigration vis-a-vis -vis Homeland Security and the, maybe the yeah, way the that, Trump administration viewed it? That's a really great question. So uh, let me say one thing about family uh, separation at the outset here. Uh, and for folks who haven't seen me out here talking about that uh, subject, I'm, I'm happy to get into additional detail. What ended up happening with family separation at the border was one of the most, and this is my opinion, one of the most disgusting and inhumane things that we saw happen during the Donald Trump administration. We are literally talking about young children that were in border facilities or that were in inadequate facilities for extended periods of time in a way that is, you cannot say it's anything other than inhumane. How did we end up in that situation? I would say that it was a predictable policy train wreck. And one of the worst ones that I witnessed in the entirety of my two and a half years in the Trump administration. And one in which we need to do everything possible to make sure it doesn't happen again. Okay, that's the short answer to the question. Uh, I don't support it. I think my only regret would be that there wasn't more I could do to lay my body on the train tracks to prevent us from ending up in that situation. Now, to walk you back in time, you'd asked about me personally, and you'd asked about what role uh, that I played. I'm happy to answer that question. Uh, when I first came into the administration for John Kelly, I came in essentially as his national security advisor, as his counselor for things like intelligence and counterterrorism and cybersecurity. So I didn't work on immigration issues uh, for uh, a good bulk of my tenure in the administration. Um, but what did happen in that time where I was over working on national security issues at the department is that the White House was trying to get John Kelly, when he was Homeland Security Secretary, to implement a policy to deliberately pull all women and children, you know, fathers and children apart at the border to deter families from coming. 
because the bulk of the people we were seeing coming towards the border were coming in family units. And that's because they knew if they showed up with children, they wouldn't be prosecuted for getting for crossing illegally and they would get to come into the country. So there actually was a human trafficking concern as well, because a lot of people were showing up with their own children. But we also were seeing a lot of people showing up with children who'd been trafficked essentially as a golden ticket to get into the United States. So what the White House said to John Kelly at the time was, we want you to implement a policy to deliberately pull those children and parents apart. It'll be really ugly for a few months, but then they'll stop coming. I remember the day that John Kelly came into the staff conference room and banged his fist on the table. And he said to us, don't you ever let anyone from the White House call and tell you that we're going to implement that type of policy. We're not doing it. That's not what we stand for. It's not happening here. End of conversation. It was important that he said that. Now, I remember not having worked on immigration issues at the time thinking, I don't know what we're actually talking about. But we had the advisors in the room that really worked on those issues. When Kirsten Nielsen became Secretary of Homeland Security in December of 2017, the White House tried to do this again. They said, we want a deliberate policy of family separation at the border. Anyone shows up, pull them apart. Nielsen said the same thing. She said, no, we're not going to do that. That's inhumane. That's not our policy. What ended up happening, and this is the short version of the story, is the, the White House worked with the Justice Department to implement a modified policy. What they called it was zero tolerance. And they said, fine, if we can't get all children separated from their parents at the border to deter migrants, then what we're going to do is we're going to prosecute every single adult that crosses illegally. Because here's what you can do at the southern border. If this is the southern border, there are entry points, legal entry points all over the southern border, where if you are fleeing violence and persecution in your country, you show up at one of those entry points. And you can show up safely and say, I'm freeing violence. I want to apply for asylum in the United States. And that's good. That's who we are as a country. We take refugees. We take asylees. But if people cross in between those ports of entry, technically it's against the law. It's called entry without inspection. It's a relatively low level crime, uh, but it's against the law. So what the, and usually the United States, even going back to the Obama administration, prosecuted about 10% or 20% of people who crossed illegally, right? They'd arrest them, they'd prosecute them. And when they did, what happened was brief family separation. Because when you go prosecute someone in a courthouse, you don't take the kids to the jail. That's inhumane. So the kids would have to wait at a border facility. So you prosecute the adult, they would convict them of crossing illegally, and then they would deport them with their family back home. Or if the children had parent, uh, family members in the United States, they could stay. That's roughly how the system worked. What the attorney general decided to do was he said, we're not going to prosecute 10% anymore. We are going to prosecute 100% of people who cross illegally at the border. He announced that policy without getting the agreement from the Department of Homeland Security. And right around that time, I stopped working on just counterterrorism issues. And I, I, I took over as deputy chief of staff of the department. So I came in after the decision had been made into the middle of this debate about the attorney general deciding to do something that we hadn't agreed to. Well, here's the concern, is when you go from prosecuting 10% to 100% of the people who cross the border, including the people who show up with children, the system cannot simply prosecute people fast enough to get them back with their families and either get them home or let them into the United States, depending on what the judge decides. What do I mean by all of that? In short, this was a very foreseeable humanitarian disaster. So what happened at the time was the attorney general announced that policy, but for weeks and I think maybe months, it didn't go into effect. The reason it didn't go into effect is because our department said, well, there's no way in hell we can do this because if we do this right now, we're going to have children who are away from their parents for potentially days or weeks. We cannot, we don't have the resources to do this in a way that's humane and that allows people to stay together. Um, what ended up happening in that process is that the White House held a meeting and they said, we're sick of the Department of Homeland Security saying, no, we're taking a vote. We're taking a vote as an administration with the key cabinet secretaries and senior advisors about whether we're going to go forward with this. And, uh, and there was a meeting held at the White House, and everyone raised their hand and voted, yes, we should implement it. Uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security, which at the time was Kirsten Nielsen, a lot of people don't know this, actually said, no, I'm not voting for this because we don't have the resources. What happened in the days that followed is the Justice Department said, don't worry, we have enough judges and lawyers to send down to the border. There won't be any problems. And then our own agency heads at DHS, and I'm not going to name those people right now, but our own agency heads at DHS responsible for border and immigration went to the secretary after they had talked to the White House and said, you're hyperventilating. You guys are freaking out. We have all the tools we need to be able to protect children during the brief period, the afternoon where the parent goes to see the judge, because that, that's ultimately what happened in that process is eventually they'd see the judge. 
uh, and then people will be back together and there's not gonna be a problem. Um, the secretary was outvoted, that policy went into effect and it turned into the absolute predictable nightmare that we should have seen. What do I want the lesson to be here? Well, outside of the fact that a disgusting and inhumane policy was implemented and shouldn't have, it's that this administration didn't do what a good administration needs to do, which is a robust policy process where you think through all the primary, secondary, and tertiary consequences of an action. And people falsely thought without doing the analysis that there was an, abil an ability to prevent children from being separated from their parents. When in fact, you all know this because you deal with your government on a yearly basis when you do your taxes and other things. Our government doesn't move that fast. It works very slowly. And because the time wasn't taken to assess this, we ended up causing extraordinary trauma to thousands of families that needed not to experience it. So look, the good news here is as the disaster got worse, I went to the secretary and said, we've got a, the president needs to order the attorney general to end this. He needs to order him to end this, you know, prosecute everyone policy because it's a disaster. We convinced the White House to draft an executive order to put an end to it. What I'm really disappointed to tell you is that once I then later became chief of staff and really then started to oversee immigration issues at the department, every single month after that, the president of the United States told us he wanted to reinstitute the policy, but he wanted to do the version he wanted in year one, rip every kid apart, even the families that come to the border lawfully and say, I want asylum. I tell you what, I cannot have any excuse for that. And we refuse steadfastly. And if the president had ordered us to implement family separation on steroids, which he did many times, but if he'd been successful, um, we would have resigned on the spot. Uh, but I had to fight that every single month. It's one of the reasons I actually left the Trump administration is because I couldn't put up uh, with those policies being ordered any longer. And saying no was no longer enough. So well, Pete, you were right. That was a, a long answer because it, it's a difficult question and a thorny issue, but one we have to focus on. But it's a perfect segue to the last question. I hope you can stay Please. with us for five or 10 more minutes. Of course I can. Okay. Um, and this is about the anonymous op-ed. Um, and I've Chris heard of it. Who is the director of the Marshawn Center, is curious about your decision to remain in office, but to secretly undermine the administration and the blocking of Trump's activities. Isn't the way you secretively block the president undemocratic? Why not public res publicly resign instead? And how do you see your moral obligations in that context? Yeah. And those uh, viewing, no more questions. We're, we're done. This will take probably 10 minutes. <laughs> well, uh, well, well, thanks for that question. And look, I deserve all the scrutiny in the world for how I decided to handle that. Let me walk you through my logic, but it's very debatable logic and it's easy to disagree with and to come up with counter arguments. Uh, here's what's happening at the time. When I wrote the op-ed anonymously about the president, um, I was actually, and I've only, this may be the first time I've said it publicly, but right around that time period, I was very actively urging, I'm not going to name names, but a wide swath of the cabinet to resign. At that point, I think we had gotten past that inflection that I mentioned earlier, uh, which is a lot of people stayed in the administration because they thought they were preventing enough bad things from happening. And look, love or hate Donald Trump, I'm just going to be honest with you. On an almost weekly basis, we were on the receiving end of presidential orders that were either unethical, immoral, inappropriate, impossible, and in some cases actually illegal. So it was important to go to the president, speak truth to power and say, sir, we cannot do that, right? We cannot do X, Y, or Z thing you want to because it's not appropriate to do. So some of the great cabinet members that came in early in the Trump administration felt very passionately that uh, they needed to stay. In fact, the question I got asked was, you know, is it as bad as it looks inside the Trump administration? My answer was always, no, it's not as bad as it looks. It is worse. It is worse than it looks. And so people would say, well, if it's that bad, why would you stay? And my response is, because it's that bad. Because it's very important that people who know things, like we'll take national security in the department that I was in. We just talked at length about some very complicated national security challenges. Our worry in DHS was, if the president fired all of us or if we resigned in mass, the people that would take our places were, would be people who never worked in national security, would be people who don't understand emerging threats from drones or cyber and counterterrorism, would be people who wanted to be rubber stamps and say yes to everything the president wanted. What was the consequence of that? Most of us went into this administration knowing it would damage our lives, our reputations, our families, our careers, but I got into 
public policy because of 9-11. I'm not a political guy. I didn't ever work on political campaigns. Uh, I got in because I wanted to protect people. My concern at the department was if we all left, there wouldn't be enough people able to run that place. I think part of that thesis has been validated. The president has replaced a lot of his national security cabinet with less qualified and less qualified, less qualified people over time who've been much more inclined to say yes to things they probably shouldn't say yes to. However, there comes that inflection point that I mentioned earlier where saying no is no longer enough because if the president isn't listening to his advisors anymore and he wants to undertake actions, no matter what, that some of us would be, uh, view as detrimental. Look, he's the man who was elected by the American people. So what I tried to make very clear in the op-ed, but much more so later in the book, a warning was when we tried to thwart the president's bad impulses, what I'm not talking about is an evil, traitorous deep state that ignored lawful orders from the president. I'm not talking about the president said, you do X and we secretly conspired to not do it. What I'm talking about is people who were willing to say to the president, sir, we need to help you understand why the thing you're asking us is illegal. I'll give you an example. The president once asked us uh, to just take migrants and start putting them in Guantanamo Bay, the terrorist prison in Cuba. Okay, I think most people who are watching right now would agree that's a pretty egregious, inappropriate, and potentially illegal solution to the immigration problem is to send innocent women and children into a terrorist prison in Cuba where Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was the plotter of the 9-11 attacks resides. Um, that's not a responsible thing to do. I worried in that time period when we were getting requests like that, that there were people the president wanted to replace us with who would have said, yeah, Mr. President, I'll look into that. We'll see if we can do that. But when you get to that point where the president says, I'm gonna do it anyway, that's about the time you need to consider resigning and speaking out. So earlier than I left the administration, I was really actively trying to get others to do that. When I wrote the op-ed, um, look, the breaking point for me was one night the White House called and uh, John McCain had just died. And uh, he's someone that personally I'd looked up to and worked with uh, on Capitol Hill. And uh, he meant a lot to me. And so we had lowered the flags around the country to half mass. DHS sends out a notice to federal buildings to lower the flags. The president called and said uh, he, he wanted the flags raised back up. He didn't want to honor John McCain. A lot of bad things had happened before that. I'm not saying that's the most egregious thing Trump ever did. It was my breaking point. Uh, in the middle of the night, I woke up that night and I wrote the op-ed to send a, a message. What I wanted to make clear to people was, look, there's a lot of bad things happening in this administration, but Americans should be partly reassured by the fact that there are actually very, very good people in this government. There are good people like John Kelly and Rex Tillerson and H.R. McMaster and Jim Mattis, and that there were other folks, some of them actually had been fired at that point by the president, but there are good folks trying to do what's right, even if Donald Trump's impulses were to do what's wrong. My thesis, was roundly disproven. I wanna make one thing clear on this call. I was wrong in that op-ed and I was wrong about one big thing and that is the suggestion that unelected bureaucrats like myself and others could steer the president away from wrongdoing and towards doing what's right. Because over time, the president would revert back to doing those things anyway and systematically purged the people who would speak truth to power. People who would tell him what he needed to hear rather than what he wanted to hear he wanted to get rid of those people. So that's ultimately why I wrote a warning was to say, look, I was wrong, everybody. I was wrong in that op-ed. And the reason I wrote it anonymously was for one very, very important reason. And that is I'd gotten to know this man and he's very vindictive. And when someone comes out and criticizes the president, he doesn't engage with them on the merits of the conversation or the ideas. Donald Trump just goes straight to personal attacks, which means the ideas get left lying, bleeding in a ditch on the side of the road. So I wrote the book, not because I was afraid to speak out my own name, but because I wanted to write a character study on Donald Trump based on everything I'd seen. And one where he would have to focus on the claims that were made in the book and not focus on fighting the person. Now, I ended up being right because Donald Trump ended up contesting nothing that was written in the book. In fact, I don't think there's actually a line in a warning that since someone has come to me and challenged factually, I invited I actually begged someone to write a rejoinder. I said, if there's someone out there that disagrees with this, write a rejoinder, feel free to do it anonymously and let's have a debate about ideas. But one thing I did promise in that book was I'm not gonna hide forever because I think it's very important for me to subject myself to criticism, to subject my own character and record to scrutiny and come out and talk about the things I know about Trump. So that's why I did that in August. That's why several months before the election, I said, look, I'm gonna come out under my own name 
and the White House can blast me all they want and do all the personal attacks. But I'm going to talk about the anecdotes I wasn't able to talk about in the book, the, the specific things to buttress my points about the president's character. Um, and, uh, and that's why I did what I did. But I also felt like it was important to let people know eventually that I had also been anonymous because I didn't think it was right to wait until I was in the safety of a Biden administration to say, haha, Trump's not going to attack me now and they won't you know, come after me and they won't threaten violence against me. Um, that to me would have been cowardly to wait. So I felt like it was important to take the mask off and to tell people, look, there's no white knight that's going to save you. There's not some hidden anonymous person that's going to you know, blow the lid off this White House. It's up to you. And my, my exhortation to the American people was, I'm taking my mask off, so take your mask off too. Please keep your COVID masks on, but your metaphorical mask was my message. Is there's a lot of people that were scared to speak out against this president. My point was, we don't need to be scared anymore. We need to avoid this culture of intimidation that's been created. We need to come together. We need to speak the truth. Now, I don't want to end on just a partisan note, because look, I'm a lifelong Republican. I wanted this president to succeed. Some of you may disagree and think that this president was a successful president. I served in the administration. I felt like he wasn't. I felt like he made America less safe. But I think what we can all agree on is that we are fed up with the vitriol from the right or the left. The vitriol in this country is a national security threat. The discord that we're experiencing is a threat to the fabric of our republic. It makes our country less safe. And I think we can all agree that we need to get past that. So Democrat or Republican, as we move into a Biden administration, potentially under divided government, we need to get back to each other at a local level. And I'm talking about the people who come over at Thanksgiving at your house, who you don't wanna to talk to because they disagree with you politically. Let's start talking to those people again. That's what we've gotta do. We've gotta come back together. So uh, Pete, I really appreciate the questions I got today. Uh, really glad that we got some hard balls at the end. Happy to come back anytime. And I thank you all who participated for listening to me drone on this long. And hopefully we can start a good dialogue on advancing American security uh, in this next administration. Well, thanks, Miles, for uh, an outstanding talk, a really informative lecture, uh, your forthright answers to some pretty difficult questions at times. And um, I'd like you to be back uh, to the Mershon Center uh, in the future when uh, you know, when the situation uh, calls for it. And as uh, I think uh, one of the characters in Star Wars said, we will be watching your future career with some interest. Well, uh, for... I appreciate it very much. And if I can have a last word, it would be go Hoosiers. And I'm really sorry, Buckeyes. I hope you don't have too tough of a Saturday over there. But look, if you beat me, I will eat crow, Pete. So maybe next time I get to see you guys in person. For those of you still uh, online, I'd like to remind you that coming up Thursday is a... Uh, American Foreign and Military Policy Discussion Group on uh, pandemic security and the future of pandemic security in the United States with Juliet Kayem from the Harvard Kennedy School. And then on December 3rd, the legacy and thought of Brent Scowcroft uh, from 4 to 5 p.m. And uh, so join us for those last two events uh, for this semester. So on behalf of uh, my colleagues, uh, thank you again, Miles. And we will, you all have a good evening.